Good morning, church family. Glad to be with you in this study of, uh, of James. Uh, I'm going to start off telling you a little story. It's not a true story. I'll just be up front with you. It's a joke uh, about these nuns who had been visiting and working in the hospital taking care of people, and they were on their way back to their, to the, I guess, their nunnery where nuns live, and they ran out of gas in their car. And so they're trying to figure out what to do about it, and the only thing they have in their car to carry gasoline is, is a bedpan. And so they get their bedpan and they walk to the nearest service station and they're coming back with a bedpan full of gasoline to put in their car and the guy drives by and sees the nuns pouring the gas out of this bedpan into their car. And the guy stops by on the side of the road and he says, I don't know if that's going to work, but I really appreciate your faith. <laughs> I love that joke. I don't know if you can use it or not in your life, but anyway, it's a good joke. We're going to talk today about faith and what it is and maybe what it's not. We're actually going to be here for a couple of days it's a pretty big subject, particularly James talks about faith and works. So let's dive in. We're going to start in chapter 2, verse 14. What good is, my, is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I say, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them on out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Uh, sounds like James has is in some intense discussion here with some people. Sounds like he might be a little bit upset with some folks even about this idea. I said earlier in this study that the book of James is probably the most practical down-to-earth book in the whole Bible. There's not a lot of great sermons. There's not a lot of great theology or debates here like you might see in the book of Romans or in the book of Hebrews. It's just very practical how to. Well, today's lesson, I'm going to have to back up on that a little bit because this idea about faith and works is fundamental theology that we have to kind of understand. Are we saved by faith? Are we saved by works? Some have rephrased that to say, are we saved by faith alone is what you'll, the phrase you'll hear sometimes. And you can see that James has some definite opinions on this from his perspective, and so does Paul, and we'll get there a little bit later today and for sure in the lesson tomorrow. So this debate, these teachings go back thousands of years. And so as I often say sometimes in Bible, because I'm glad we finally got that solved, we're still wrestling with this faith and works thing even 2,000 years later. This book of James is largely written to Jewish Christians. It says to the dispersion, to the 12 tribes who were dispersed out of Jerusalem, the readers were Jewish and it's hard for me as a, as a non-Jew to understand all that came with being a Jew and then now being converted into Christianity. They had their feasts, they had their rituals, they had their high holy days, they had the priesthood, they had sacrifice, and all that was their religion. It was their the way they related to God. This emphasis on keeping rules and doing everything exactly the right way. Very prescriptive. You do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And if you do this, then you do this. There were ceremony and regulations were everything to them. And now if you are a Jew and you believe that this Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah and you subscribe to that and you're immersed, you're, you go through this mikvah, this baptism into this fellowship with Christ and all those believers, now what? Well, you don't turn off that old Jewishness in your life like a light switch. You hang on to a lot of that, and that's what we see in the early church. And so for the Jews, so much emphasis on externals, on rituals, and doing things like that, it's hard for them to not associate that with their salvation and with their relationship with God. 
and the, they even had the idea that the more strictly you could obey those things, the better off you were, the better your relationship with God. But now in this thing called Christianity, this thing called the way, we have folks like Paul who are around teaching that it's all about grace. It's all about heart. It's all about relationship. That God's love extended towards us, even to us who are non-Jews. There was a lot going on in the mind of these Jewish Christians. And I want to be respectful of that. But Paul says over in Ephesians 2, you know this very well. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed to us in the kindnesses in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that anyone could boast. And there's the great rub. you got the Apostle Paul saying this, and you got James over here saying this. We are saved by God's grace works all those rituals all the following of the sacrificial laws the dietary laws really have nothing to do with salvation anymore according to paul and there's so there's two extremes that you see in these early christians and there's two extremes that we deal with today one is i believe that and so i abandon all of those regulations and i just do away with them i do whatever i want i'm in christ i've, I've done what i need to be to be in christ and so there are no res regulations, there are no rules, so I just leave any way I want to. And the other extreme to that is I continue to embrace the rules and work-oriented salvation and try to do both, try to be in Christ and also embrace the, 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 the law of Moses, and that will drive you crazy. Like in most extremes, when I find myself on any extreme, on any issue, I find myself in a bad spot, and it's, you're there with this as well. So today we're going to talk about faith and we're going to try to define it. And then tomorrow I want us to talk about what faith actually looks like in our lives maybe today. How do you define faith? Well, for many of you who are listening in on this recording or this, uh, what this, these Bible lessons that we're doing, you're a Bible student or you wouldn't be listening today. So you're immediately going to go to Hebrews 11, chapter uh, verse 1. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. The old King James says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know that definition. That, you can't hardly improve on that. Faith is confidence. It's assurance. It's evidence. Even when we can't see things, it's a conviction that changes us. And if you continue in this chapter 11, these assurances and these convictions bring about some incredible things in the lives of all these people that are listed in Hebrews 11. So we have our Sunday school answer of, of faith and our definition of faith is our Sunday school answer. But even in our vocabulary today, we use the word faith sometimes in a, in a way that, that gives us some pause. Um, we hear somebody say this, what faith are you? And we use that question to decide, are you a Christian? Are you a Jewish? Are you Islam? Are you Hindu? In other words, what is your fundamental faith? And we use that terminology, what faith are you? In Christendom, we might ask the question to delineate a denomination. Uh, are you a Baptist? Are you a Methodist? Are you Pentecostal? Or are you non-denominational, which non-denominational has become a denomination of itself? So we try to delineate. Sometimes we use that phraseology there. Uh, you, you hear folks talking about brother so-and-so was a faithful Christian. And usually when we hear that term, it's often at a funeral or just in trying to describe somebody, somebody who went to church all the time, who was there when the doors were open, but also somebody who lived a good life, who, you know, the old saying, they didn't smoke, drink, or chew, or hang out with those who do. There's no obvious immorality in their life. And we don't need to discount those people or make fun of those people. May their tribe increase. But that's really not the definition that we're talking about about faith as well. Uh, there's an elephant in the room that we have to kind of get to as we're talking about faith and works, particularly when it comes into this discussion about the churches of Christ. And we have to kind of get down to that nitty-gritty today. There's this debate about faith and works. Is it really a question of faith alone? And it's often used as an argument from some of our friends in other groups against our teaching on baptism. 
because they say that baptism is a work and so it's not, it can't be required, it can't be essential because we're not saved by works. And we have to kind of talk through that a little bit and hopefully we can do that in the next day or two. Paul makes it pretty clear that we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace through faith and not of works. So what is faith? Is it believing something? Is it believing something strong enough to make it happen like the nuns putting the gasoline in their car? James talks about three different kinds of faith here. The first one is a dead faith. And James is pretty clear on that. A faith that is not, does not display anything, any good works, any evidence of a changed nature. If there's nothing there, he calls it a dead faith. The kind of faith that James wants us to have is not just a mental assent, maybe even an a intellectual or educational conclusion. You know, you, you, there's a lot of people in, in academia that believe in God and maybe even believe in Jesus Christ, but they don't evidence it in their life. It's more just a mental or an academic ascent. And James says, no, it's got to, it's got to come out and, and display in your life. Uh, it has to be affected by their, uh, it has to affect their lives. Second kind of faith that James talks about is a demonic faith or the faith that the demons have. It's interesting that James says the devil has a kind of faith of his own, and it's obviously not a saving type faith. Someone said there's no atheist in hell. And that's a kind of a crude statement, uh, and I would encourage you to be careful how you use that. But the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So at some point, and for some people at the end of their life, they will understand. I, I made the comment one time to Cecilia, how many of you remember Carl Sagan? He was a great scientist, uh, had a uh, show on Channel 13 PBS called Cosmos. But he was an atheist. He did not believe in God. He was very persuasive, a great looking guy, very intelligent guy, but he was an atheist and he died back in 1996. And I said to somebody, did you know that Carl Sagan is a believer today? And they said, really? I, I thought that would have made the news when he became a Christian. And I said, well, he's a believer today because he's now seen Jesus Christ as the judge at his death. There is a demonic kind of faith that does not believe to a saving kind of faith. And that saving kind of faith is what we're trying to get to that James talks about, a faith that brings about a saving relationship with God. And both Paul and James are actually in agreement on this. This weekend I spent some time watching a video from the BibleProject.com. I've told you about that. And this, this video this weekend was called Listen. And it was a study based on Deuteronomy 6 called the Shema. You know what that is, the Shema? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might. The Shema, that's the word for hear. That's the word for listen. And you see that throughout Proverbs. You see that out throughout Christ's teaching. He says, hear, O Israel, or listen to me, or as he starts some kind of a teaching. The Jewish people prayed this Shema, this prayer, several times a day. Hear, the Jewish word for hear it's not the same word that I use for here when I'm in my language today. The Hebrew word shema, to listen, is the same word as obey. They're the same word. When the Jewish people hear the word hear in the shema, it's you listen and you obey. Uh, I think about hearing through the ear, but this shema means I hear with my heart and I hear with my hands and my feet. It moves from just my head to my hands and my feet. In God's language, there's no separation between hearing and doing. It's like me telling my kids, I want you to clean up your room before I get back today. And I come home and their, their rooms aren't cleaned up and I say, did you hear me? And they might say, well, yeah, we heard you, but I meant, did you hear me and obey me? And that's what the Shema is. And it's hard to study the book of James in these little segmented deals because James is kind of intertwined. But you remember back in James chapter 1, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it is, uh, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then afterwards immediately forget what he looks like. He says, Be doers of the word, not hear hearers only. That's that concept of Shema. When we hear God, we obey God. And James says when we have faith, it, 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 it evolves into work. It's not a separation. It's the same thing. Faith is not just belief. It's not just hearing the word. It's 
having the right, it's not just having the right doctrine, it's not just going to the right church, it's not even believing the right things. A saving faith translates out into my obedience, into what I do. It is allowing those beliefs to change me and that relationship with God that changes me into something that I was not before I had faith. If we get the definition of faith down correctly, there is no misunderstanding. There is no duplicity here. There's no discrepancy between Paul and James on this. I want to close this lesson today with a quote from John Calvin. Some of you may think, oh, that's kind of crazy, talking about John Calvin, talking about faith and works. But listen to what John Calvin said about faith. It is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. We'll unpack that tomorrow as we continue this discussion out of James 2. Have a good day.